and this book is called Let Me Be a Free Man, a documentary history of Indian resistance. Just talking about the copper-colored tribes of America, the aboriginals. Again, Let Me Be a Free Man, a documentary history of Indian resistance compiled and edited by Jane B. Katz. Says the sources for all the selections used in this anthology are listed in the back of the book, beginning on page 179. All right. She's talking about the sources. All right. So these are the sources she's talking about, beginning on page 179. So you can see uh, everything she talks about. She has a source for it. All right. In this book. All right. The person. I don't know if she's she. But you see all the sources, right? So verify it yourself if you like. I am telling you true, I will die, you will die. The story will be for the people who come after us, for them to see and know what was done here. Yellow Wolf of the Nest Purse Preface Most white people who have written of the historic Indian white clashes have not dealt fairly with the Indian. As Yellow Wolf of the Nez Perce tribe writes, the whites told only one side. All right. So again, history is written by the conquerors, right? Not by the people who got conquered. So the history, you know, is by what the conquerors have taught us, right? That doctrine, that false, that hijack. Only his best deeds, only the worst deeds of the Indians has the white man told. Indeed, most white accounts of the Indian resistance were based on reports by military men trained Indian fighters who regarded all Indians as hostiles, all right, hostiles, we're talking about uh, enemies of Christ, pagans, talking about dumb diverses, all right, the servant of their fate, glory-seeking generals who exaggerated Indian savagery to excuse their own brutality. In recent years, attempts have been made to correct this injustice, but the press still tends to regard Indians who fight for their rights as extremists, and it rarely presents their point of view. All right, so isn't that kind of like the same as what's going on today? So they, you know, shooting down people, innocent people, and then you protest, and then they, you're, you know, then you got to, you know, you're a criminal because you're protesting an extremist. Introduction. They love their neighbors as themselves, wrote Christopher Columbus, of the natives he encountered on the Caribbean islands in 1492. All right, they love their neighbors as themselves. These people are unskilled at arms, he continued. With 50 men, they could all be subjected and made to do all one wished. So remember, we've talked over this, how Columbus bragged, how he can easily enslave the Caribbeans, the Carib people, with just 50 men. He's writing to the queen when he got there. We got his journals, right, and past books and past videos. Again, with 50 men, they could all be subjected and made to do all one wish. Who's he talking about? The Indians. He's talking about enslaving them, make them do what one wished. And what they wished was to create plantations so they can create an economy, be rich, a free labor, and enslave. The Europeans who followed Columbus to the New World, first the Spanish and later the English, felt much the same way. Proud and imperious, they were determined to impose their lifestyle and religion on Los Indios. Their lifestyle and religion. Religion. The original inhabitants of the Americas. But the white invaders underestimated their opponent. The Native American was fiercely independent and he would fight to the death to protect his land and his way. His land and his way. Protect your land and your way. Of life. For centuries before the coming of white people, Indians had lived undisturbed on the plains and in the woodlands and river valleys of North America. Dakota, Anishinaabe, Kiowa, the tribal names and languages were as diverse as their traditions. Yet the Indians had much in common. They shared a respect for the earth, a respect for the earth, the source of all life, and a reverence for the great spirit, Hawa. 
Jahawa Wakantanka. The great spirit. Yes, we were spiritual people. Reverence to the great spirit. Hawa. Which they found in all of creation. In all of creation. Viewing themselves as part of the natural world. The Indians cared for it and conserved its resources. Take care of your land. Take care of your resources. And that's what the ancestors did. We got to get back to that. Most tribes lived a nomadic existence following the trail of big game. And this was a potential source of conflict. Since tribal borders were not clearly defined, a tribe often had to fight to keep invaders out of its hunting and farming territory. Intertribal wars erupted frequently, but members of the same tribe cooperated in the use of the land, sharing all its life-giving resources. It was customary for tribal members to share power just as they shared land. Thus, tribal government was essentially democratic. The most common form of government was the open council, consisting of representatives of the various tribal bands. The council members were the leaders of the tribe, and each was permitted to speak. The objective was to achieve consensus or a general agreement. Let's get to an agreement. Before undertaking a course of action, a chief sought through persuasion to win support for his policies, and he often became a skilled orator. But the chief was only one voice among many and the other members of the council were not compelled to follow him. Since a chief's powers were thus limited, he could not easily become a tyrant. You see the difference? All right, it's not set up for you to become an absolute tyrant and have all power. It's different how we roll that the chiefs, what a chief is, CK, Katsing, priest king. In contrast, white Europeans had long lived under the tyranny of kings they were used to that in the old world whites had enslaved non-whites and rich landowners had employed exploited the poor thus the europeans who came to the new world considered it their right and even their duty to become masters of the continent this however was no simple task the european colonists found themselves in a threatening alien environment Neither the land nor its people were easily subdued. The colonies pressured the natives to adopt supposedly civilized European lifestyle. But the Indians preferred the ways of their ancestors. The ways of their ancestors. Christian missionaries of various sects competed for possession of the native soul. They wanted your soul. They competed for your soul. All right. And there were conversions. But in most cases, the Indians clung inwardly to their ancient creeds. Remember your ancient creeds. The settlers offered money for tribal lands. But money had no value for the Indians. Who found in the forests and streams all they needed for life. That's all you needed. You don't need no money. Eidos. What you talking about? You want to check. Reparations. What you need is in the forests and streams. That's all you need for life. So when all else failed, the colonists took repressive measures to bring the natives to their knees. Again, when all their little trickery and their little uh, treaties failed, their negotiations, their um, <laughs> offerings of money failed, they took repressive measures to bring you, your ancestors, to their knees. In time, the Indians learned to play the political games of the colonists. They made alliances with the European powers, playing one off against the other. But in the end, the natives were left to fend for themselves, hoping to avoid warfare. Some Indian chiefs tried to negotiate with the settlers. In speeches remarkable for their eloquence and logic, they spoke of time-honored laws forbidden the sale of tribal lands, time-honored laws, this is your lot, and of their wish to be left alone. They spoke through interpreters to white chiefs who could not or would not understand. Civilized 
white people used devious tactics to ensnare the natives. Some chiefs succumbed to the settlers' bribes and threats and signed treaties. Again, some chiefs what succumbed to the settlers' bribes, the money, and their threats. They got scared. They didn't hold it down and signed treaties, or maybe they were thinking peace for their people, right? Either way, it wasn't good for them in the long run. The terms of which were misleading. The chiefs were led to believe that the settlers would pay for the privilege of using tribal lands, but that the lands would belong to the tribes as long as the rivers run and the grass shall grow. You thought that's what you thought before you signed the treaty. You sold out the land. That's what you thought. Words were sacred to the Indians and they took the wording of treaties literally. All right, verbal agreement, man. We don't lie, keep it real. You gotta keep it real. Too late. They awoke to find their people disposed and their promised payments not forthcoming. Too late. They tricked you. Too late. It became clear that the white people did not share the land. They schemed to obtain it for themselves. Their words were not sacred. Their treaties were made to be broken. Again, their treaties were made to be broken. You fell for it. And how many tribes did you sell out by doing these treaties? The settlers eventually won U.S. government support for their claims to Indian lands. Then troops were dispatched to round up Indians and remove them to lands nobody else wanted. Peacefully, if possible, by force, if necessary. All right? Either way, they're moving you. Either way, you're being moved. Either way, you're about to get moved. In 1830, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act, legalizing such action. All right. Now, this is very important. I want to mention a side note here. This is telling you this is when they legalized it because there was already tribes being removed. For example, like from Ohio, way back all the way from 1830s, they were already planning it, plotting it. Right. So again, in 1830, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act, legalizing such action. It was legal now. It means they weren't doing it before means that in, that wasn't the first time they started doing it. All right. You got to read into that. The other trail of tears. A formerly self-supporting and self-reliant people suddenly found themselves reduced to the status of, of wards of the U.S. government. Dependent and lacking any control over their future. All right. Very important. So who's living like that today? Whose wards... Huh? Of the U.S. government Dependent Every month Dependent on that check Right? Dependent And lacking any control Over their future That's all you do Is depend Government policy Reflected a total lack Of understanding Of Indian custom As historian Hazel Hertzberg Writes in the search For an American Indian Identity Indian hunters Were expected To become Farmers Overnight Frequently on land unfit for farming. In Indian societies where farming was the traditional occupation of women, men were expected to take the plow easily. I'm a warrior. What you mean I got to farm? I got to go, you know, be a warrior. The Indian chiefs were men of vision and they saw the threat to their way of life. They saw their land being swallowed up by the white intruder. Their people roof, ruthlessly shifted about, removed, shifted about, deprived of homes, livelihood, and self-respect. They saw families torn apart, and they saw whites stir up old rivalries among tribes, even paying Indians to drive their brothers from their homes. The whole fabric of tribal life, it seemed, was coming apart. All right, so we got a little bit of that, how you know the French, the English, the Dutch, the Spanish were using different tribes to war on each other and enslave each other and right? I that's we read we know this is factual history I'm just talking about the so-called uh, Negro of America the Aboriginal copper colored tribes of America that's who we're talking about 
you're not an African. This is who we're talking about in this book. When we're talking about so-called Indian, the Indian. I know a lot of you got problems with the word Indian, all right? It's, it's, it's bigger than that, you know? It's reference. Right now, we're using it as a reference, all right? We're going to break that word down one day. Don't worry. All right, so iron willed men, the chiefs organized for resistance. While some tribes fought independently, others allied themselves with former enemies to fight for their liberty and way of life, just as the colonists had fought for theirs. As the Indians' counterattack gained momentum, the white press unleashed a war of words against the Native Americans. As newspapers that had failed to report white attacks on Indian camps now described Indian raids in grim detail, arousing the public's fear and hatred. All right, so they were doing propaganda. Propaganda, right? Like they still do today. Stereotyping, uh, putting images on the news, right? They did the same thing back then. Soon there was talk of exterminating the savage. Exterminating them? When the newspapers took up the hue and cry, the army responded by staging unprovoked attacks on unarmed Indian camps. Staging, staging, false flag, staging, fake, staging, provoked attacks on unarmed Indian camps, Indian aboriginals, so-called Negro camps. As Indian scalp brought a high price and killing became a profitable business, Indian vengeance was in turn swift and violence escalated on both sides. The wars that followed were bitter and bloody. Wars always are. Trained in the use of guerrilla tactics, the Indians won many victories by outmaneuvering the enemy. But inevitably, inevitably, they were overcome by the white man's powerful armies and advanced technology. The Indians fought bravely, however, long after they knew they were doomed to defeat. By the 1890s, the last of the rebellious tribes had surrendered. Now the Indians were herded off to detention camps called reservations. Sun-baked lands lacking vegetation and wild game. There, starvation and disease completed the job the wars had begun. All right. The Indians who survived were forced into submission. A people who had once dreamed great dreams now lost their capacity to dream. A people who had once dreamed great dreams, visionaries. What did the prophets do in the Bible? They had dreams, right? They can interpret dreams. A lot of them. But what happened? Because you once could interpret dreams and you had dreams. And they were great dreams. Now lost their capacity. You lost your capacity to dream. You ain't dreaming big enough. You need your land back, not a check. You got to dream big, great dreams, unity, clean rivers, your land back, living free. We don't need money. We don't need wars. We don't need people controlling us. We're powerful. Although most of its leaders were annihil annihilated, the Indian resistance was never entirely crushed. In the early 20th century, Native Americans began using words, not guns, to awaken the American public to the injustices suffered by their people. They asked for an end to the Stiflin reservation system. They asked too for the recognition of their treaty rights and for the right to govern themselves. Even after Indians won the legal battle for equal rights under the law, they continued to be dominated by whites. Gradually, the Indian resistance revived. Dynamic young leaders arose to positions of influence in Indian society, and they worked to rebuild and unite the tribes drawing their strength from the knowledge of their past. They reawakened their people's faith in the future. When peaceful protests failed to bring reforms, some leaders turned militant. Today, the struggle goes on as Indians, so-called Negroes, in the tradition of their forefathers, take direct action to win control over their lives. Are you ready to take direct action to win control over your life? 